Okay, thanks for the nice introduction. My clicker is working, so that's all good. Um, quick, quick information about myself. I'm not a database person. Um, I'm working as an architect in Microsoft's database group, which is very gracious to host me there because I'm mostly stirring trouble by talking about how to make them more useful for machine learning and, and stuff like that. Uh, I've been exposed to database people for a long wh while now, for about 10 years, so I have some appreciation for the challenges of databases. Um, but I'm, I'm not a database person. I might phrase things wrongly and, and all of that. And if, if you have questions around that, just feel free to even interrupt me in the middle of the talk. As Todd said, I, I want to make machine learning more useful to more people. right? And what I found over the past couple of uh, years is that is extremely challenging. And a lot of it is accidental complexity. And this talk is about kind of two angles to deal with the accidental complexity of machine learning. And then I'm going to close with a bunch of open questions. So why would anyone in their right mind use machine learning, right? Because we have all seen the videos of the uh, images that look entirely like a stop sign to a human being, but they look like a 60 mile speed limit to the autopilot in your car, right? Why would anyone do this? Or the plastic turtle that gets misclassified as an assault rifle. Why would you have that? Well, because you can't program an image classifier. People tried and failed. Even basic stuff like detecting whether or not an image uh, contains a face is entirely unsolved other than by using machine learning. Right? So people make do with machine learning because they want to function in their software that they can't otherwise program. If they could, they would, and they should. Maybe in the current hype age, they wouldn't, but they still should. Um, another example is like all of these personalization things, like what should the correct price be? How much do I like a product? And all of these things. Um, we as human beings are incredibly inconsistent with ourselves about that. So those things, they just they evade traditional programming. That's why someone wants a function in their software that they can't program, but turns out that they can learn. So that's kind of a, a point of view that I'm taking. And that is, data science is just software engineering. But instead of taking a text file and a compiler to make a binary, you take a text file, a machine learning toolkit, and a lot of data to make a binary. So models are just software. That means they need to be deployed and updated like software. They need to be tested like software. Uh, and all of these have subtle differences, but we don't even get to the state of treating them like software yet. Right? And most importantly, they are debugged like software. If you have a machine shop and, and, your, and your fancy reinforcement learning system all of a sudden orders you a million screws, but you only needed 10, you want to know why and you want to debug that. Right? And that is, that is excruciatingly painful today. Uh, but on the other hand, the training data that you use to make your model, that needs management. Right? Because we have increasingly private and increasingly regulated training data. I mean, uh, those of us in industry have suffered through the transition into GDR, GDPR compliance. And that's just the beginning. right? I mean, we have more and more of an awareness in society that um, the training data or the data that companies have about ourselves needs to be managed. So a folder with images on the laptop of a data scientist is not going to cut it in the long run. Right? We currently get away with that, but that's not going to work. Also, the data is dynamic. Like People add and subtract, and they update. Then there's some retention policy, which says you can only keep this data for like three months, and then it goes, has to go away. Like All of that needs to happen. Good news is that most of the people in this room know entirely how to do this. So that's why I think databases are super important for machine learning. Uh, and we haven't quite realized the, the potential there for, for managing the training data sets. Um, so I'm going to talk about two projects that I've been involved in that attack both of these sides of the accidental complexity. right? Because for models as software, we don't treat them as software. We are so bad at making them that we have to stick them into a container and put them on the web as an endpoint. Right? That is not software. That is just, oh my gosh, I didn't understand how I could actually link this into a static binary, and therefore I have to uh, boot half an operating system up there. Uh, and also, we don't really manage our data sets. We don't even run machine learning usually close to the data, which is very important for compliance and, and similar reasons. I'm not so convinced that it's important for performance. OK, let's talk about the first side. ML.NET is a project that we've launched a while ago to bring machine learning into the .NET ecosystem. Hasn't been done by me. I, I just got lucky and got to lead the team through this process. Uh, there have been, I don't know, 
several dozen, if not a hundred engineers working on this over time. A couple of thousand users within Microsoft have sent us gracious bug reports that were incre incredibly helpful over the years. Quick intro to .NET, because I noticed that in many academic, at least academic audiences, people don't know. Uh, why do we care about .NET? Well, we as Microsoft care about it, well, it's our developer base, right? But why would you care about .NET? It has a lot of cool stuff that machine learning people care about. It has C-sharp, which is like Java, but from the future, right? So it always has the, the version of like Java in four or five years is what is in C-sharp now. It has F-sharp, which feels a lot like Python, but with types and proper multi-threading. How cool is that? Um, and what I am most excited about it is it has almost free calls into native code. And that is important to us. Because if you're sitting in Java land or in, uh, in other language environments, you want access to your SIMD unit on your, on your processors, right? Yesterday we had this nice talk from Intel about AVX 512 and how great it is. Yeah, but if you can't use it, it's really troubling. And, and, and a lot of that use happens through native code. Um, a lot of people don't know this, uh, but .NET went open source about four years ago. Um, it's cross-platform, runs on Windows, which is not the surprise, but it also runs on Linux and Mac OS and various ARM devices and phones and all of that. Um, and it runs on interesting hardware, right? It runs on the Xbox, it runs on IoT devices, so all of those places it runs. And lots of people build stuff in it. The most interesting statistics that the .NET team taught me is half of the top 10,000 websites in the world are built in .NET. Um, if you ask half of the top 10, the answer is that's probably not true, right? How many of the top 10? Probably Bing.com and Microsoft.com. But if you look at half of the top 10,000, that's, that's a pretty impressive number. And it's all of the boring stuff, right? Your insurance agency, your car dealership, like all of that, the long tail of websites that are functional but not really fancy. Okay, so what is ML.NET? ML.NET is machine learning made for .NET developers. And that's important. We, we target developers first, which means we look at scenarios that developers typically want to do, and then we build software that supports those scenarios. Uh, it's available in C-sharp, F-sharp, and Visual Basic.net. Uh, yesterday, we had our first Stack Overflow question from someone who actually uses it from Visual Basic. We had a little party. That was kind of fun. Um, it's open source and cross-platform, just like .NET. And it has been used in, within Microsoft for like almost a decade at this point. So it's used all over the place. And I want to show you one of those use cases because I think it's cool. The PowerPoint designer, if you use modern versions of PowerPoint, suggests to you how to lay out your slides. You just slap like bullet points and pictures onto a slide, and it will suggest to you many ways in which this might look good. And this is a this is a various machine learning models behind the scenes that generate these uh, recommendations. And as you will see, most of my slides in this slide deck have been made by a model trained in ML.NET. You will see this because sometimes they're inconsistent and different slides follow a different slide style. Okay, it's, it's, they totally do, but they don't get to review my slides, so I'm all good. Um, ML.NET is used in, in many Microsoft products. For those of you who have ever touched a Microsoft uh, uh, or talked with Microsoft people um, or have been at Microsoft, it, it used to be called TLC within the company. Um, you have likely used an ML.NET model today, although it's early in the day, so I'm not sure. But some of your emails must have gone through an exchange server and the spam filter in there is, uh, is ML.NET. Um, if you use any like, form of antivirus on Windows from us, that's ML.NET. If you log in with your face on a Windows device, that's ML.NET. Uh, if you have been subjected to an ad on the internet that we serve, that's ML.NET. We are sorry. Um, so all of that stuff is co coming through that. So why do all of these people use ML.NET within the company, right? Clearly, Microsoft has a very open policy. If someone wants to use Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow or what have you, they can do that. We don't really uh, enforce a, a certain machine learning toolkit within the company. And they do this because uh, using ML.NET is just like using any other library. It's not that Python thing where you have your ASP.NET application on the side and you have to figure out how to call each other, set up some separate scaling infrastructure for your Python containers and all of that, right? So it's just code. So you can say a model is a thing that I loan, load, and then for that model, um, I get a prediction function, um, and I can use this to make predictions, right? That, that's all there is. Hmm? This is C-sharp, yes. Um, or it's a PowerPoint version of C-sharp. I'm not sure whether it actually compiles. Um, so this is just a standard software dependency, right? You go into Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, you say, hey, I want to add a dependency. The dependency is uh, Microsoft.ml, and then you, you have all the code necessary. 
and the model is just a it's just a resource that you have to ship with your uh, application, right? In ML.NET, a very crucial concept we have is we, we use the term model in machine learning to mean many things, and it's really confusing to people outside the community, and it's really a thing that adds to the accidental complexity of machine learning. We actually like the term pipelines, machine learning pipelines or predictive pipelines, because a model is always some data preprocessing that goes from the actual data space, let's say classes, records, images, what have you, into some vector space on which we actually know how to compute in machine learning, right? And that code has to be exactly the same at training and prediction time. If you clip your images the wrong way at prediction time, the face recognizer in your, in your laptop won't work. If you tokenize text a different way, the thing that sorts your emails in Outlook will not work correctly. So what is in that zip file is actually a full pipeline. We have a full DAG language, all of the usual things of many operators. And models developed at least in-house at Microsoft, we don't see what our, our users outside do, get excruciatingly complex, like hundreds of operators in a single model. Um, that's, for instance, the, the nice thing in, in Word that tells you that you can rephrase your sentence a little bit to make it, uh, to make it simpler to read. That, that model is enormous. Um, and the, the, the components we have in our pipelines are, of course, when you do training, you need to have some data ingestion, like the data has to come from somewhere, support text files, SQL, in memory, and you can write your own. Um, then all of this transformation from some domain object to vectors, it's called featureization. We have 80, 90 transformations for that. And then, of course, at the end, we have learning algorithms, right? That's the thing that traditionally people call a model, right? Just the thing at the end. But we really care about the full pipeline because that makes it possible that I can train a model, I can give it to a software developer who works on a front end, picks it up. The input is an object of class person, and the output is a prediction of whether or not that person is credit worthy. It's not the input is, I don't know, some vector of numbers, right? All of that is, ca is captured, and it makes it very possible to facilitate cooperation in, in software development pro uh, projects that use machine learning. So is it any good? Uh, we think it is, and we'll publish more benchmarks as soon as we hit 1.0. Um, we are usually around like 50x uh, faster than scikit-learn, which is the moral equivalent in the Python ecosystem to ML.NET. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but roughly like an order of magnitude, like 50x-ish. Uh, and that's, uh, we get this mostly out of careful avoidance of memory allocations and deallocations. So, uh, our core data structure called iDataView is very inspired by database engines, and it just avoids as many memory allocations as it can, and it does very careful and clever tricks to abuse the .NET just-in-time compiler for runtime code generation. For those of you who have worked on database engines, you start from scratch in C++ and you build your code generator. We just abused the one that we found in .NET when we started. Right? So we got, we got a bit lucky there. Um, also, it produces really good models. So what you have in this plot, I don't know how I make a pointer. Uh, what you have in this plot is, on the right-hand side, is the accuracy right, of the models that you train. Um, and we train on 0.1 to 100% of some data set. And you see that ML.NET always dominates scikit-learn. And this is because this is trained with the defaults. There's no hyperparameter tuning that happened here. And then uh, if there were machine learning people in the room, they would th throw tomatoes at me and say, what the hell, you didn't do hi hyperparameter tuning. Well, the decision that we made is we do all the hyperparameter tuning at Microsoft. We have a very large data set of hundreds of tasks that people typically do. And for these typical tasks, we typically do well. So we have data scientists sitting in an office who just tune all the hyperparameters to be good by default. It doesn't mean that hyperparameter tuning doesn't get you an even better model. But it means that if you don't do hyperparameter tuning, and let's be honest, most software developers never will, you get a decent model. Right? And what's, what's really interesting is the machine learning tasks that people actually do are not as varied as the machine learning literature makes you believe. Like every company on the planet needs a multi-class text classifier of text that looks roughly like email into roughly 10 classes. That's their support at mycompany.com email address that needs to be routed. That's their issue tracker for uh, issues with the building, with the software, with something. Like, they all need this. And, you, and it turns out you can solve that problem once and give them the pipeline, and they will, they will be just fine. 
Uh, we open sourced this a year ago, and we have done monthly releases ever since. Uh, and we've gotten an enormous amount of interesting and API changing feedback in that process. Uh, we've uh, hit 1.0 RC1 uh, this Tuesday, um, and it looks nothing like the original API it had last May. And that's because we learned a lot about how software developers actually think about their problems. So one really interesting example, which a lot of people uh, from the database uh, community will, will relate to, we had some clever optimizations in our API. We decided where to cache things automatically. We decided whether or not to normalize data at what point and all of that. We had to take all of that out. Software developers hated it because we hit the uncanny valley between imperative code and declarative code. It all looked imperative, but some of it was actually declarative. And software developers really hated it because they couldn't look at the code and say, how much memory will this consume? How long will this run? All of those questions. So we took all of that out again. And I think there's an opportunity for us to go to a fully declarative API in the future where we bring back all of these optimizations. But that was a real learning exercise. There was real passion in the bug reports that people send us uh, when we started to do behind the scenes optimizations. So much about ML.NET and the whole kind of reducing the accidental complexity of machine learning for software developers by bringing it into their tools, calling the thing a DLL and not a, a model and all of that. There's two more projects that I can't talk about today that are really interesting. Pretzel is a model compiler that was built in my team, um, which takes many ML.NET models and compiles them into one binary. And that is super attractive to us because we have customers who take, let's say, uh, a fraud prevention model and train one instance per branch of their company. And then for each of their branches, they deploy that. But all of those models look the same. They have the same structure. Everything's the same. It's just different parameters inside. And it turns out that you can compile them into very efficient uh, binaries, which you then can deploy to the cloud and run like hundreds of models in the space of 10. Right? Um, the other project that's ongoing is we are looking at Torch and making that available to .NET developers. So we are basically look, taking PyTorch, removing the Python, adding .NET, and making that available to developers, which is a really interesting exercise because you're crossing over from a dynamically typed world into a statically typed world. And there's lots of programming languages challenges there. So much for the software development side of the accidental complexity. Now I want to quickly talk a bit about uh, distributed machine learning, where the data is. Because a lot of the problems with on, on the data management side of machine learning are that the data is the asset that the companies or the customers care about. Fundamentally, there are rules about data. There's very rarely rules about software. This might change as we get regulation about AI. Um, but right now, the thing that most rules exist about is data. Data can't move here. Who can access? You have to log everything. So there's a strong desire to make machine learning run in compliance with those data rules. And that, um, in, in the work that I've done in the past there, is we looked at kind of how can we make machine learning run where the data is, like literally where the data is. And we looked at distributed systems for this because this is a big problem for places like Bing, right? Uh, it's not a big problem for many co other companies, but the big companies all have that problem. And what they increasingly have is some sort of a resource manager that manages their compute resources where they want to have one cluster or one cloud or however you want to call it uh, that is used by all workloads, right, uh, such that you can kind of timeshare the investment in the cluster. And then the resources are handed out as containers, right? Each of those containers is some slice of a machine. Depending on how sophisticated your cloud manager is or your resource manager is, this can be just uh, some RAM and some CPU. It can be enforced, can be not be enforced. It can be some I.O. bandwidth. That is kind of vague, but all of them basically have this abstraction, and there are many of them, right? We have one on Azure called Azure Batch. Then there's Apache Hadoop Yarn, there's Apache Mesos, there's Google Borg, um, there's many of them. But they all kind of follow the same pattern of giving you slices of machines in a negotiation protocol. Uh, and when you write software for these places, you have a bunch of challenges. Because uh, let's say, oh yeah, in this field of rectangles is your containers, that's my abstraction. And the, the colored rectangles here are your application. So there's some application running, and you can have a bunch of interesting challenges, right? You have Fault tolerance, like someone tripped over a power cable, or more realistically, uh, urgent software update goes through your cluster or something like that, which takes some machines offline. And your application has to be tolerant to that. Database engines are tolerant to that, right? Spark is awesome at that. 
Um, all of the various big data da uh, databases have solved this. Machine learning software is pretty terrible at it. Um, there might be preemption. Somebody else is more important and or has more money than you and runs your, uh, and, and buys you out of your cluster. This is especially interesting on clouds that have dynamic pricing and where the prices get updated often. You might start your job at a price where you say, I can afford 100 containers, but in the middle of it, you no longer can afford them because somebody else uh, vacated you. But of course, the other direction also happens where all of a sudden the prices go down, you have to choose kind of what you want to do with that information. I spent a lot of time in the last decade or so uh, in a project which is now called Apache Reef, which makes all of this kind of abstract in the physical sense, but not the logical sense. So all of these events turn into events, into a main control flow, and you can act on it. And I did all of this because I was really interested in how to make machine learning work in this space. But with machine learning, you have a really interesting problem, right? Uh, because machine learning thrives with gang scheduling. We do iterations over a fixed data set. So the most uh, straightforward way to do this is get a bunch of machines, load your data into main memory, ideally get as few machines as possible, such that you have low communication overhead, and get going on it, right? So a very simple version of that is just a master-slave setup, right? Where you have some master that farms out tasks and then aggregates back and rebroadcasts the, um, the current model. Trouble is, that's not how your cluster looks like. This is what your cluster looks like. You have, if your cluster is actually so empty that you can walk up to it and you can say, I'd like to have 100 machines right now, and you get them. Someone is paying too much for this exercise. Either the owner of the cluster, because they leave a uh, uh, headroom, too much headroom on their cluster, or you, because they make you pay for that extra headroom, right? There's really no way out of it. So utilization on these clusters is paramount. That's why you do a resource manager in the first place. That's why it's so important that systems like Spark, Hadoop, Hive, and all of those are very elastic in their computation, such that they can make use with like changing amounts of, uh, of resources. Uh, now, if you run there, you have kind of two standard approaches, right? There's one way where you do MPI, and then you just have to wait for all the machines to be available, right? Because uh, in an MPI job, you, you have gang scheduling as a core semantic. So you have to just sit there and get one machine, and then wait, then you get another machine, you wait, you get another machine. Eventually, you have your 100 machines. That is super expensive. As a cloud provider, we don't really care because you pay for that, right? Uh, but that's still kind of bad because we have machines that basically do no work other than waiting for other machines to become available. Um, the other approach is in, in MapReduce or Spark or similar systems where you start to do the work on fewer machines. Yes, you can write most machine learning algorithms as a loop around MapReduce or a loop around group by aggregates, but then you have to run the work of 100 machines on the five or so that you already have in your system at that point. So it's excruciatingly slow. So either wait and then you're fast or you're slow. Right? So none of these are very attractive. So let's see whether we can do some better than that, something better than that. Uh, and one approach that we did like a long while ago now is elastic machine learning. There what we say is we ramp up the workload, meaning the data, in lockstep with the available resources. So when you have five of 100 machines, you take 5% of the training data and start training. If you have 10 of 100 machines, you take 10% of the training data and start running, right? And you do this iteratively until you reach the full number of machines. So in the first iteration, you might just have two machines, right? And you just compute on only a fraction of the data. This iteration is as fast as every other iteration, assuming that your communication stack is properly pipelined and all of that. Um, and then in the second iteration, you might have some more machines. Uh, in further down the road, you might get eventually get all the machines that you originally asked for. And in this process, you get more and more data in lockstep with more and more machines. So why does this work? So theoretically, you can always say that what you have from the small data, what you train on the small data, is just the hot start solution for training on the next bigger data set. And there is, depending on how complex your model class is, there is hope or actual uh, proof that that gets you closer to the uh, global solution of your problem. Right? There's a lot of work in like, for linear models, you can totally prove this out. For, even for DNNs, people see this, that originally you need very little data to make progress. Towards the uh, final, when you, when you get closer and closer to the optimal point of your problem, you need more and more data to really find it. So this, this really jives well with the actual optimization that's happening in your system. 
Um, so does it work? Well, it does. In this plot, you see uh, x-axis is time in minutes, and the y-axis is the objective function of our, of our machine learning problem. And the red line is our system simulating MPI. You wait till you have all the machines, and then you start working. Right? And you see that instantly you go down in your, in, your, in your objective function a lot because the first few iterations always have this, uh, this property that if you start with random, you do one step, you're very close already to the optimum. Right? The green situation is the situation where your cluster operator has so much headroom that they can instantly give you, in this case, 255 machines uh, with no delay. So there's still delay here because all of those machines now hit your storage system at the same time asking for files. Right? So each of those containers that you now have hits the storage system. You still have to wait for the slowest of those to be done with either the data loading or their first iteration before you can continue at, at full speed. Right? The blue line is our system. Uh, that assumes you can start at, I think, four machines or five machines. Our system is not that flexible to start at one. Um, and then immediately starts learning from 5% of the data and then keeps, keeps adding data as machines become available. And as you can see, the shape of the curve is roughly the same. I mean, the, the jump down gets a little slower uh, on the blue line if you were to project them all to the left. Uh, but you also see that the system, which is elastic, is basically done by the time the MPI system can start. And that's, that's a really interesting outcome of this. And we were very surprised by this. Right? We, looked at, um, we looked at this, um, this problem initially from a um, fault, uh, fault tolerance perspective. Uh, and we were not aware of this kind of uh, starting the process problem. And this is a surprise outcome of this, but actually the main outcome of this. Turns out if you need your machines to stay up for two hours, that generally happens just fine. But this, hot, this starting problem, you always have the ramp up problem on every job. Recently, uh, last summer, we had an intern, Yorking, who is interested in solving the fault tolerance problem with coded computing. I will just give a brief summary of that. Um, instead of having uh, the data partitioned just by row onto different containers, you also partition it uh, by column uh, through the coded computing approach. We just compute an equation over the input data such that any one, sorry, any three out of those six containers that you now have per row can recreate the input data, right? This is just like RAID disks or any of those, but applied to data sets and, and matrices in memory, right? Now you have a relationship where you can say, if I add twice the containers, I can live with half the failures, right? You can have half of them disappear, um, and that makes it pretty fault tolerant, and it also makes it exact. It's computing the exact same solution, and this is interesting, because in the next plot, I'm going to disprove what I showed earlier. Um, this is a data set where we uh, simulate a random failure of 10 machines, 10 out of 20 machines at all times. And if that is your regime, um, the approach that I showed you, to you earlier, which is elastic and allows machines to come and go, will never converge. Because you, you have this problem that um, you, you always kind of lose half of the data that told you something about to go in a direction, and then the other half comes online. Right? So you will never see full convergence, while in this approach you do. Because um, as, as you have the coded computing approach, you can recover any partition of data that is lost if 10 out of 20 machines disappear. So you have the exact same outcome as if no failure happened. Of course, this comes at a cost, right? You invest twice the number of resources to, uh, to survive the failure. Uh, realistically, people should do like 20% uh, over... Um, over allocation, such that one out of five machines can fail instead of one out of two. Okay, I talked about two things, um, kind of the point of view that data science is just software engineering with data, and that we have to kind of treat machine learning software more like software engineering disciplines and make, reduce the accidental complexity, get it all into the normal software development workflow. And on the other side, the challenges of if we actually wanted to do machine learning where the data is, those systems are pretty hostile to machine learning processes. Right? The, the fact that it's elastic and uh, faults happen all the time uh, is really hostile, and there are ways to deal with that. Of course, there are many more open questions right, in, in this space. There's this whole question of, for software, we have source control. For data on mo and models, we have question mark. Right? It's, kind of, it's, it's not entirely clear to me how you even do a data diff. Right? 
Uh, for software, we have a code review. If you, if you want to change software, you send a pull request. There is a code review. There is a process that everybody understands how to leave comments, how to discuss this, how to make changes, iterations, all of that. Yeah, but if data is the reason that you make new software, then how do you review that data? Right? How do you even do a diff between two data sets that's meaningful? Right? Um, there are papers, right? but there is not a dominant approach of how this should be done as an engineering practice. Uh, for software, we have semantic versions. Th those are the ones which like version a.b.c, where you increment c when it's a patch, b when it gets better, and a when it gets in, uh, sorry, and a when it's incompatible. Right? When you go from version 1.2 to 2, it means it's no longer the same software. 1.0 to 1.1 means it's better. 1.0.0 to 1.0.1 means it's a patch. What is the same thing for software uh, for models? Right? You can't even prove for a DNN that when you train it and you add one data point to the training data set that the resulting model is at least as good as the last one you had. There's no theoretical guarantee that gives you that today. So how do we even get to making models updatable and testable and all of that? It's a really open challenge. Uh, we have debuggers for software, right? Depending on, on, on the language and stuff, they get really good. You can, you can do time travel debugging. You can look at what really happened, all of that. We don't have that for, for models, right? Uh, software, we has all sorts of security issues, which I think we haven't even solved for software. But one of the hacks that we do in everyday life is just to sign it, and we trust the person that signed them. What do we do with models? How do we build a signing chain for the training data? How do we make it so that the training data used to train my model was not poisoned by someone to produce a model such that my system makes decisions that the attacker on the training data wanted to have happen? That's the thing that I lived through at, at Yahoo when I was working on the Yahoo Mail spam filter. Because you have people who sign up for Yahoo Mail accounts who can click the spam, not spam button all day long to poison the well. Right? How, how do you ensure this pipeline? How do you promise to the ex eventual user of a model that you can uh, take responsibility for that model? It's entirely unsolved in practice. It's, it's only the most advanced organizations who figure out how to do this for use cases which are as benign as spam filtering. If that goes wrong, nobody dies. If a manufacturing process that chooses whether or not the medication that, that is put into this bottle is correctly dosed, if that goes wrong, people might die, right? So we don't have that really under control as a software engineering discipline, and there's lots more to do to make machine learning more useful to those people. So thanks for your time. Thanks for showing up at 9 o'clock. Um, these are a bunch of links. I'll put the slides onto the website so you don't have to copy-paste them. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Marcus. That, that, was, that was a great talk. I, I think that more of us need to be thinking about it from the point of view of, of software development. I, I think it would also be interesting to really focus on what's different between software development and, and model development. There, there, uh, I, there were several talks at Strata mm -hmm. about um, how software development and, and model development and deployment are, are different, and I think it would be really interesting to to meld the two together into one into one thought, Marcus mentioned uh, he worked at, at Yahoo at, on the on the uh, spam filter stuff. I learned something as I was talking to him about his talk. He, he uh, hit one of his one of his glory uh, glory days was to uh, to have two weeks where he felt like he was actually ahead of the spammers, right? <laughs> Two glorious weeks at yes. Yahoo where he was winning versus the off. spammers. <laughs> Unfortunately, only two weeks, but, <laughs> but, you know, small, small wins, right? So we will take some questions here. We have some time for some questions. Yeah. Kitty. Um, you mentioned that you have... Uh, internally develop defaults for hyperparameters for, mm -hmm. for the models. But those are those by just general type of model or by the intended task of the model? Or, I mean, it can't be the same for all possible models, right? So, so we, have, we have both. Um, we have uh, defaults for the full pipeline, like what type pipeline you should use for a specific task, like text classification of basically email into 10 classes. Uh, but then also per learning algorithm, we have chosen all of the defaults to work well across uh, many hundred data sets. Right? So even if you have a task that doesn't fit kind of what we generally look at uh, or what we have a specific solution for, it will still do OK. Uh, and this is in stark contrast to things like scikit-learn, uh, which I admire a lot and I know the people really well who work on this, where all of the defaults are the defaults of the data type. 
So booleans are false, numbers are zero, and so on. Right? For us, that's not the case. They generally make sense. In some cases, at least in the UI version, which we haven't released to the public yet, where we, um, where we pick up uh, the default for the data set based on some heuristic. None of that is perfect, but it gets you in the range. Um, so you don't, you don't get a model that just plain doesn't work. Hey, so uh, my question is, what's the unique value that the .NET provides? Uh, many of the questions you mentioned seems to be pretty generic for the older uh, model development, and it's not necessarily uh, any platform specific. So what, what is oh, the yeah, value I mean, .NET? All of the tricks that we do in ML.NET are entirely available to be implemented in other languages, right? I, I have friends at H2O who do similar things for Java. They have a similar philosophy. Uh, there's Turi Create for Apple developers, which follows a similar philosophy. So this is not unique about .NET. Like all of these approaches work there as well. Um, I just happen to work for Microsoft, where we care a lot about the .NET developer base. Right? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to this idea of the soft model engineering and so on. So I'm Chaitan Baru from UC San Diego, and. Uh, at the last KDD, we ran a workshop called Common Model Infrastructure. Couldn't come up with a better name. But it was basically about this notion of creating what we were calling a model commons. Right? Mm -hmm. a way, a way, a way, the infrastructure and the facilities by which you can share models. And uh, <coughs> you can just search CMI mm -hmm. uh, 2018 KDD. Yeah. Several of the talks were from, actually, Microsoft had a talk, Google, Uber, SAS, so there's a lot of interest, uh, interest in industry. Uh, we ran another meeting at the NIPS Expo this year. Uh, unfortunately, in next, uh, 2019 KDD, the workshop couldn't be accepted because they don't have enough space uh, at the venue in Anchorage. Um, but we are proposing this for other I, uh, IEEE uh, conference as well. The reason mm -hmm. I want to mention this is I just finished spending a few years at the National Science Foundation in Washington. And we, uh, I, you know, this is something that I was actually trying to push more academic interest in this area. So anything you all can do <laughs> to push this kind of thing, I think <laughs> it's uh, really essential. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what, what I did today, and, and maybe not everybody noticed that, is I went contrary into the view. I think you picked up on it of, hey, machine learning models are so different. Let's build a whole new s engineering discipline around that. What I discovered when I was, uh, I was working on ML.NET a lot with the uh, .NET team and with customers is that a lot of the principles of software development apply one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, to machine learning and data science. That does not mean that there isn't additional work necessary and that there are differences. But come on, we, ha we have figured out how to sign DLLs and how to sign JAR files. Let's just do the same thing if it works, right? We have figured out how, what version numbers are and how we understand them. Let's use the same ones. We have figured out how to distribute software. Let's not invent a new thing to distribute models, unless it's necessary, right? And, and my point today is, often it's not necessary. Often it's just software. And, and source control. Yes. Simple things like source control. Yes. Yeah. Well, for data, that's, that's uh, <laughs> still a bit challenging. Yeah, it, but, but it's uh, an, an important problem yes. if you have to be able to prove the result later in court. You know, yes. Six, six years from now. Yes. Right? You're sued over something long time after, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, other questions? Got time for one more, I think. Going, going. Going once, going twice. Gone. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you.